Okay, class, uh, this is our screen recording for VUS 6. Uh, and in this unit, we're going to take a look at um, what was going on in our country uh, between about 1790 and roughly 1857. Uh, 1790 to 1857, that's about right. Um, in this first section of, uh, of the screencast, we're going to look specifically at the creation of an opposition party. Now, we talked back in a couple of units ago about the Anti-Federalists and how the Anti-Federalists would become the Democratic Republicans later on, and that's exactly what has happened. So now we have two political parties. Um, we're going to uh, examine you know, some of the reasons for the creation of two parties, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the election of 1800. So to get started, um, what I want you to understand is that the emergence of the Democratic Republicans as our first opposition party comes about because of some foreign policy issues and some economic issues that they didn't agree with, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the Federalists. Um, the Federalists had uh, already um, made known their support for a bank of the United States, a federal bank. Remember, the Federalists want to keep power uh, in the national government. They very much want a strong central government. So they wanted to have a strong national bank. Uh, and they also signed something called the Jay Treaty when Washington was in office. Actually, Washington signed this treaty. It was between, it was between the United States and Great Britain. And uh, in the treaty, Great Britain remove, uh, agreed to remove uh, its troops from American soil. And you may be thinking, wait a minute, after the American Revolution uh, concluded, uh, why were there still troops here? Well, there were still British troops here, and they were out kind of like in that old northwest area uh, of, uh, of the country. Um, and they were, there were rumors that maybe they were inciting the, uh, the Indians out in that part of the uh, country to, uh, to attack settlers. Um, but uh, anyway, so Great Britain promises to remove troops from American soil. That's a problem or had been a problem. Um, Great Britain up to this point had been seizing American commercial ships on the open seas and impressing American sailors or forcing American sailors to serve uh, the, uh, the, in the British Navy against their will. Um, the treaty in the United States, the Jay Treaty in the United States, was actually very unpopular um, because it didn't really resolve anything between the United States and Great Britain, uh, and many people just thought it was kind of useless. In fact, it, uh, it, it really kind of put us at odds with, uh, with France uh, over uh, you know, signing this treaty. Uh, the French weren't happy about it at all. Um, because it looked like we were going to be friendly with Great Britain again, and they didn't want that to happen, and it was, it was kind of a mess. Um, anyway, we're also at the same time kind of having this undeclared war with France, uh, and that is something that the Democratic Republicans did not want, but the Federalists did want, because the Federalists didn't like France, and they like Great Britain, uh, but that's a st story for another for another uh, screencast. Now, anyway, it's out of these it's out of these differences that we see the emergence of this new party called the Democratic Republicans. Uh, they are going to be led by Thomas Jefferson and by James Madison. Now, if you remember early on, James Madison had been a Federalist, but he's going to change. He's going to change teams. He's actually going to join the Democratic Republicans. Now, as we get into the presidential election of 1800. Um, this is a very, very important presidential election, and you should know it for the test. Uh, it's won by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is going to defeat John Adams. John Adams was the Federalist, and the Federalist, and he was the second president of the United States. Um, Jefferson wins the election. The Democratic Republicans win the election. Nobody thought that the United States could do it. Everyone thought the United States was going to erupt in civil war. Uh, no time, or may I guess up to that point, there had been uh, no... Uh, example of, uh, of, a, of a party, a political party, very voluntarily giving up um, the reins of power to the opposition. Okay, so people in Europe were watching this election closely to see what would happen, um, and people were taking bets against the United States, thinking the United States is probably going to implode over this election, and we didn't. Uh, it was amazing because uh, uh, when the uh, election results came, came in, um, John Adams lost, and he resigned office, or he left office, and Thomas Jefferson, the Democratic Republican, took over, and there was a peaceful transfer of power, and that's why it's significant. That's very important to remember. Um, 
The, uh, the Federalists, as you probably know by now, uh, we've talked about it in class, uh, are going to be led by John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. And again, they believed in a strong national government uh, and a commercial economy. They, uh, they wanted uh, uh, manufacturers and business leaders and, and, and people that were in the shipping industry really to, to be the basis of our economy. Um, and most of those, uh, those economic activities were based in the Northeast. So there's a difference there um, in that the, uh, in that the uh, Federalists are getting a lot of their support out of the North. All right, where I started to talk about North-South here, and we're still in the late, se late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, the Democratic Republicans, like I said earlier, led by uh, Jefferson and Madison, uh, really want to keep the power in the state. They, they don't want a strong national government because if you remember from the last unit, they feared that a strong national government would take power away from the individual, take power away from the state, maybe even erode the rights of individuals. So that, that whole thing was an issue. If you remember back to the uh, uh, adoption of the Bill of Rights um, in 1791, um, these Democratic Republicans are going to be supported mainly in the South, a big surprise, okay, um, by, uh, by farmers and artisans, people who made things with their hands, and also frontier settlers in the South, or what we would call the you know, places like along the Gulf states today, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, places like that. Um, so these Democratic Republicans are, again, are going to want to keep power uh, in the states, and they're basically supported by people in the South, and uh, the Federalists are going to want to uh, uh, give uh, power to the national government, and they are going to be supported by people mainly uh, in the Northeast. Okay, class, in this second uh, part of the US 6, we will be looking at the period uh, like I said earlier, 1790 to about 1856 or 57. And we're going to be uh, looking specifically at some economic issues uh, and strategic interests that are going to be supported by a popular belief that we're going to call Manifest Destiny. And we're going to see how those things combine to uh, encourage settlers to spread coast to coast. In other words, we're going to expand all the way out to uh, to the Pacific, to what is now California. And in that, expan in that expansion, we're going to have uh, conflicts with American Indians um, as settlers pour into their territory. Um, we're also going to explore uh, some of the uh, issues that are going on in the antebellum period in American history, or that period uh, before the Civil War, uh, dealing with expansion and immigration uh, and industrial growth, economic growth, things like that. Um, all again, a lot of it's going to be all or most of it fueled by this this belief in, in what we call manifest destiny. Okay, so that's kind of a an introduction uh, uh, into where we're going in this uh, in this section. Um, the first thing we're going to start with really is expansion that came about because of the Louisiana Purchase. Um, Jefferson, uh, if you recall, is elected in 1800. Um, in 1803, the same year of the famous court case Marbury v. Madison, just for review, uh, if you recall that, uh, that court case and the key principle coming out of it being judicial review, uh, that same year, um, Jefferson is going to purchase uh, the Louisiana Territory uh, from France. Uh, and that is kind of a shocking development because Jefferson is a Democratic Republican. And we know Democratic Republicans, if you recall, didn't believe uh, that you could do too much uh, politically that wasn't listed in the Constitution. In other words, the uh, Democratic Republicans were very conservative uh, in how they interpreted the Constitution. Uh, historians would call them strict constructionalists. Um, but Jefferson, in this case, didn't behave like a strict constructionalist because uh, at the first opportunity to purchase Louisiana from the French, uh, he did. Um, he bought uh, the entire Louisiana Territory. Um, actually, he really just wanted to buy, as I recall, just wanted to buy New Orleans so that we could get our, uh, get our crops on barges down the Mississippi River and then out into the Gulf uh, and into the global economy. But uh, France needed money, 
and instead of just offering to sell the Port of New Orleans, uh, they offered to sell the United States the entire Louisiana Territory, and Jefferson uh, sort of snatched it up. Um, and he took a lot of heat for it uh, from Congress, uh, from his political opponents, because he really, there's nowhere in the Constitution that the president's authorized to buy up land, but he did. Uh, in fact, uh, his purchase um, doubled the size of the United States overnight. So it was uh, one of the greatest land purchases in history. Um, not long after the purchase, uh, he is going to um, authorize Meriwether Lewis uh, to explore the Louisiana Territory. And actually, he sends Meriwether Lewis uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Philosophical Society of, uh, of Philadelphia for, uh, you know, to kind of catch up on some coursework and navigation and geography and maybe botany and some other things to get him ready for the uh, expedition. Uh, and he also uh, uh, tells Lewis, or Meriwether Lewis, that is, to go ahead and, uh, and, and pick someone to go with him. And he of course, we know picks um, William Clark, uh, his old friend, and the two of them uh, are going to set out on this journey across the continent. Uh, it's not something we have a great opportunity to study in our course, and it's unfortunate because it's one of the greatest, I think, uh, stories in American history. They are going to take along with them uh, an Indian interpreter. Uh, many people call her uh, Sacagawea, but I believe the uh, correct pronunciation is Sakagaway. Um and she is a Shoshone woman. Actually, she's about 16, I think. Um, and her husband, uh, uh, whose name is um, oh, Toussaint Charbonneau, and about 48 other people. So actually, it wasn't just Lewis and Clark and Sakagaway. Uh, there were about 48 people on this expedition. Uh, and the expedition itself is called the Corps of Discovery. It's fascinating. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, story. If you are interested in it, I can recommend a video by Ken Burns. It's called The Core of Discovery. I'm sure you can find it uh, somewhere on the internet. Uh, great story. Um, anyway, um, they're, uh, they're going, these, th this Core of Discovery is going to set out across the continent from uh, really from St. Louis all the way out to, uh, to California, and they're going to open that uh, territory. Uh, along the way, they're going to meet Indians and, uh, and, and offer peace tokens to them, and, uh, and they're going to survive, uh, and it's a terrific story. Um, after, uh, after the uh, Louisiana Purchase of 1803, uh, Jefferson's going to leave office. Uh, James Madison is going to be our fourth president, and it's during James Madison's administration that we get into the War of 1812. Uh, and uh, this is a war that we, it's really our second war with Great Britain. Um, we're going to win the war. Uh, it's going to be, um, a lot of it's going to be fought, in fact, all of it's going to be fought along the East Coast, especially the, uh, the, uh, the Northeast Coast and the, uh, the Middle Atlantic. Um, it's going to, our victory in the War of 1812 will uh, produce a claim in America to the Oregon Territory, which was a contested territory at the time. Great Britain claimed it. Uh, I believe Russia had been up in there looking around, uh, trying to make land claims. But this is going to give uh, the United States claim to the Oregon Territory. And it's also going to increase migration uh, into Florida. Uh, Florida at the time was controlled by Spain. Um, and Americans are going to start pouring into Florida. Uh, Spain has lost virtually all of its territory in North America, except for Florida. Um, and I think, uh, I think Spain could kind of read the writing on the wall. They knew it, was, it would be very difficult uh, to hold on to Florida um, with uh, the United States claiming all the land around it. So I think very wisely they struck a treaty with the United States in 1819 called the Treaty of adams onias uh, and they, uh, they uh, cede that uh, territory, that's uh, Florida, we call Florida today, to the United States. Um, again, that's 1819. Um, the next thing uh, out of this section that you want to be familiar with is uh, the Monroe Doctrine. We're jumping ahead again to 1823. Um, James Monroe uh, is the president, uh, but the uh, doctrine is actually written by John Quincy Adams. Um, the, uh, the former president's son. The, um, the Monroe Doctrine has four important points that you'll want to know, okay? Uh, and I'm just going to list them for you here, uh, and they're also in your notes. Uh, the first point is that the American continents 
uh, should not be considered for future colonization by any European powers. Okay, uh, that's North, Central, and South America. Uh, the second point is that uh, nations in the Western Hemisphere were inherently different from those of Europe in that they were republics by nature. They're not monarchies. Uh, in other words, if you uh, think about a republic, um, in a republic, people who are eligible to vote uh, elect representatives. Uh, in fact, if you look at the word representatives and the, the word republic, they, they even kind of look alike a little bit. Um, and uh, that's, that's different from uh, what's back in the old world in Europe uh, where there are still kings and queens. Okay. Um, the third point is that the United States would uh, not look too kindly uh, at any attempt by European powers to colonize or impose their will on any country in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, the United States would consider it a threat to its own safety. And the first, oh, I'm sorry, the fourth point would, uh, would be uh, that if the United States, I'm sorry, if Great Britain would adhere to the terms of this, this policy or would, uh, would honor this policy, then the United States would stay out of the affairs of Europe. So uh, 1823, the Monroe Doctrine, and this is uh, really the United States sort of staking its claim uh, in the Western Hemisphere. In the next part of, uh, of this section, uh, we talk about the westward movement of settlers and uh, economic development in the period. Um, we know that uh, starting early in the 19th century, American settlers are going to start streaming westward um, into what is now Indian Territory, uh, across the Midwest, into the Southwest, and even into Texas. Uh, and they're looking for economic opportunity, uh, really in the form of land to own and to farm. Um, one of the things allowing this movement of settlers is the growth of the railroads and the canals. Uh, railroads are going to help move people and goods and supplies, materials across into the, into the West. Uh, and canals are going to help farmers get their goods uh, either down the Mississippi River to the port uh, at New Orleans or through a series of canals uh, to, the, uh, to the east. Uh, for example, the Erie Canal to get uh, to open up uh, access to uh, the big ports on the East Coast for Midwestern farmers. Very important. Um, another factor is going to be Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin. Uh, that gin is a machine that allows uh, one person to uh, to clean the seeds out of a cotton bowl. Um, very uh, before the cotton gin cleaning. Cleaning the seeds uh, off from the cotton, uh, the husk, uh, and anything else, any other foreign material in that cotton fiber was uh, very labor intensive. Uh, slaves uh, usually did the work, um, and it really, uh, it really slowed the whole process of cotton production down. In other words, it sort of bottlenecked everything uh, on the plantation farm. A plantation could, could produce, you know, tons and tons and tons of cotton but it can only sell as much as it could clean. So um, the cotton gin is going to allow uh, uh, plantation owners to clean cotton faster. Um, and that is going to uh, increase the demand for uh, more cotton. Um, cleaning cotton faster allows uh, more cotton to go to market, which drives the desire to plant more cotton and harvest more cotton and increase profits. Um, and ultimately, it leads to uh, the demand for more slaves across what we would call the Cotton Belt or the Cotton Kingdom, which runs kind of from about Smithfield all the way uh, down around almost to Texas. Uh, that whole swath of land across the Gulf Coast um, is going to be part of the Cotton Kingdom, where cotton is the main crop. Um, as people move into that area along the Gulf states, um, Ultimately, that migration is going to take people into Texas, uh, and that is uh, in time going to lead to uh, a revolt against Mexican rule. Uh, that part of, or actually Texas was, was controlled by Mexico at the time, uh, and as Americans streamed in, um, they wanted to be part of America, part of the United States. Um, and Mexico was not ready to give that land up. So there's going to be a very famous battle. You've probably heard of it, the Battle of the Alamo, um, where you have uh, a handful of Texans uh, uh, fighting against vastly overwhelming numbers of, uh, of Mexicans uh, in this battle. Uh, and the, uh, although the Texans are going to lose, the Alamo is going to be, uh, 
captured and people in it are going to be taken prisoner or killed. Uh, it really is just kind of the tip of the iceberg because ultimately Texas is going to uh, declare its independence and actually fight Mexico for that, that, uh, that independence. And they're going to win. And for a while, they're going to be a republic, uh, their own, sort of like their own little country. Uh, and then they will, uh, they will join the, uh, the United States um, later on. Uh, the victory later on, actually, speaking of uh, war with Mexico, uh, we are going to uh, have a war with Mexico between 1846 and 1848. Um, the United States will win that war, and Mexico will give its land in the southwestern corner of the country, of what is now the United States, uh, 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 to uh, the U.S. government. It's called the Mexican Cession, um, and I'll show you a map. I have a map here of it. Um, and you can see that it includes the uh, states, the present day states of California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and parts of Colorado and New Mexico. Um, easy way to remember that is CC Nuon. So California, Colorado, uh, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, it's CC Nuon. Um, and then ultimately this, this whole drive across the continent uh, to the west coast is going to be fueled by an idea called Manifest Destiny. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a, a term that was coined by, uh, by a journalist, I think, in the 1820s. Uh, and it, it sort of describes um, the, the, uh, the desire to, to move American civilization from east to west and to populate all those lands between the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean and to spread uh, American culture. Um, it, uh, it is uh, going to be a driving force, a uh, popular idea, um, the idea that the West is the promised land, the land of opportunity, uh, and uh, with the East Coast filling up, East Coast cities filling up, um, with Im uh, immigrants, uh, people coming in from all over, um, it's an opportunity uh, or actually a drive for uh, new land, new economic opportunities, um, and uh, you know, uh, whatever else the future may hold. Uh, during this period of Western migration, uh, American Indians are, Amer I'm sorry, American Indians are going to, uh, are going to come into violent conflict with settlers and with the American Army, the U.S. Army, uh, and ultimately uh, they're going to lose out and uh, they are going to be forced uh, off of their uh, lands and uh, onto reservations. One of the most famous examples of this is the, uh, the, the uh, famous Trail of Tears, which I think began about 1831. Um, and uh, in it, we're going to see the uh, forced removal of the Atlantic tribes, the uh, East Coast tribes, the uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, uh, uh, Seminole, and uh, Chickasaw, I think I, I think that's five, um, from uh, again from their east, eastern homelands to uh, reservation lands out in what is now Oklahoma. Back then it was just called Indian Territory, uh, and that's where they will stay. They'll be confined to those reservations, uh, and actually many of those reservations are still there, and the descendants of these people are still there. Um, so that's about it for uh, for the second part of this uh, of this section of this unit. Um, one thing you might want to think about uh, when you go back and uh, listen to this again, if you do, uh, is you want to concentrate on the factors that, uh, that led uh, Americans to move westward across the continent. Uh, again, it's going to be uh, the Louisiana Purchase, um, the claims that were produced as a result of the War of 1812. Uh, it'll be the idea that uh, there's economic opportunity in the West. Um, the cotton gin, uh, the spreading of uh, slavery across the Gulf coasts, um, and manifest destiny. Uh, all of these things are going to add up um, to a drive uh, to take Americans across the continent.